I'm sure you're familiar with that Maslow hierarchy of needs. Well, Professor Maslow could learn a thing or two from Jesus. Welcome to this episode of Pearls of the Interior Life. Very good to be with you as always. Thank you for making this time for the Lord. In this Sunday's Gospel, Jesus is going to give us, just in plain English, the basic requirements for discipleship. We want to look at that today. We want to compare it with kind of the, the pop psychology, psychobabble of our day. So it's very illuminating, illuminating, actually, about what drives and motivates us and where Christ wants to be in our life. Uh, and then we want to look just briefly at how, as always, how can we very practically advance in that, you know, come Monday, after after Sunday, after the Sabbath, we get back into the, the work week. How can we keep this with us? And then there are some interesting things to look at here in both the first reading from Wisdom and the Gospel reading with Christ's uh, teaching about discipleship and comparing that to kind of our, our secular view of psychology. First thing I want to start though, in, in kind of looking ahead to Sunday and especially the gospel reading, what we want to have in mind for that. Okay, now, you know, all summer long, as you've been coming through, Christ has been giving us these instructions on being a disciple, on what it takes. And as always, he speaks very plainly about needing detachment, needing to be prepared because you know not the day nor the hour or um, striving for the narrow gate and talking plainly about the reality of hell in there. Also, we do get those glimpses of, of heaven too. But again, this is this is not the, the cuddly, tame Jesus that the pop culture taste masters would, would desire for us. And because he loves us too much for that, he, he just speaks very plainly. Now, he also does all the heavy lifting for us, too, but, but these are definitely some of his you know, very tough, challenging lessons. This Sunday, as we also come to an end of summer, it really all culminates when he lays down what it is required to be a disciple. And there are three main things that he hits on. First, what you have to hate your mother and father, sister or brother, son or daughter, Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And you have to deny yourself. You have to pick up your cross and follow him. Or you cannot be my disciple. And you have to renounce your possessions. If you're not willing to do that, you cannot be my disciple. It doesn't get much plainer than that. And it's interesting. Look at the three realms he's talking about here. Possessions people and ourself. Ha. All right. So this is where we're going to come in with a parallel with Abraham Maslow. And you're familiar with that hierarchy of needs. I think he, he most often viewed it as a hierarchy of motivation. Now, Maslow is a curious figure. Uh, he, he was an avowed atheist, but he did recognize the human need for mysticism and mystical experience. In fact, there's a fourth psychology, and he at one point referred to this as a transpersonal psychology, but always an atheist. And when we look at his hierarchy of needs, it's always from a very kind of selfie perspective, very ego, very id. And Maslow, it has to be noted, he is no friend to the human person. His work is very much associated with the Cultural Revolution in the 60s, very much with the Frankfurt School of Thought, particularly at Columbia University, where he was for quite some time. And his work was especially useful to the Marxist purposes of uh, the sexual revolution, emasculating men, the transgender madness that we're in now of no difference between men and women. You can thank Mazda for quite a bit of that. But he gives us the hierarchy of needs and, and you know, from just kind of a common sense and observational standpoint, you know, it, fair enough. I, it, it makes sense that the familiar pyramid at the base are our, our basic physiological needs, the basic things that we need, shelter and food and so on. 
and safety. And once that's provided for, the next thing up on the hierarchy are the sociological needs, the need for, for belonging, to be loved and appreciated by others. Next, he places then our personal needs, self-esteem, how we see and value ourselves. So let's pause there for a moment. As Maslow proposed these, you move up the pyramid in order. You, you can't get to satisfying your social needs until you first get the physiological needs taken care of, you know, basic uh, care for yourself and security and so on. Then you can advance to the societal needs, belonging and so forth. You have to get that done then before you can get to the self-esteem because in his model of us very ego-driven, you, you need a lot of that external validation as well. Okay, and these were all necessities. If, if anything there is missing, then we're gonna be deprived and it's gonna to lead to unhappiness. Only once you get past that, can you then move up to the self-actualization. Sometimes you refer to that as transcendence and that, that will add to our happiness. That's where we can then get on to those other things that can be particularly, we would say, spiritually fulfilling. He, he would use the same words, but meaning them differently. But now is when we start going after the transcendentals in particular of, of beauty and truth and goodness. Okay, that's how Maslow sees the world and his hierarchy. Again, very selfie. And here's the key to this that we want to take away. Jesus understands these parts of our nature supremely well, much better than Maslow, because he created it, okay? And he invites us to go much deeper. Now, first, the needs that Maslow identifies all have a shadow side that Maslow wouldn't have appreciated fully, not accepting the Christian anthropology perspective of things and our fallen nature that's given to sin and vice and so forth, but take the physical needs. Well, very quickly, what's otherwise perfectly good, needing the basic things to sustain life, food, shelter, and so on, and security. Well, the things that provide them, first of all, for us, we quickly turn into idols, especially money and our possessions. And once we get past, especially in our culture, just the basic necessities and security, what does it turn into? Mm. Now it turns into our love of comfort and ease and pleasure. You know, the physical sins get in there, lust and gluttony, so the shadow side there. What about then the societal needs? As he would put it, you know, belonging and love. That's fine, that, that's perfectly good, but what's the shadow side? Hmm. It gets turned into our, our pride or our envy if we don't think that we're getting what we deserve from others. Okay, what about our self-esteem? Well, th there's vanity for you in a heartbeat if it's not properly contained through virtues and through relationship with Christ. So, Christ, and Christ recognizes all this about us. Here is what Christ is calling us to. Here's the key in his call for discipleship, when he's pointing to these things, when he says we have to renounce our possessions, that we have to hate <laughs> our neighbor, that we have to deny ourselves, What does Maslow put at the top of his hierarchy? Transcendence. That's at the very top, only after we get through all these other things. Jesus is inviting us to recognize that all of those things will be properly fulfilled when we start with him. He wants to transcend that entire pyramid. That entire pyramid is him. What does he say? Seek first the kingdom of God and all of these other things shall be given unto you. We should find him in every part of the pyramid. So at the base of the pyramid, our basic needs, we should look to him for these. He should be our sole source of security. Everything in the world is passing away. Now your heavenly father, he knows what you need. He feeds the birds. He clothes the fields and flowers. He knows what we need. He will provide 
exactly what you need when you need it. Find me there. Transcend those needs. I'm there. What about in the societal needs for belonging and for love? Well, this is the point of hating our mother and father, brother and sister, son, daughter, so on. And St. Augustine clarifies, as I think we all well know, the point is not to place these people above God because especially that's not fair to do to them. No one can live up to that. No one can live up to that. And also even to recognize, as Jesus said to Peter, when Peter was starting to go down the wrong path, get behind me, Satan. You know, we have to recognize their fallen nature. Place me first in those relationships. You know, this is the key to marriage. It's that third person in the marriage. It's Christ in that marriage. That should be true in all of our relationships, that they all flow from our relationship with Christ. Aha! Now everything is properly ordered. Now we can have a beautiful and flourishing marriage. Now we can be the best parents or siblings or friends that we can possibly be. That's yes, the right order. Transcend those social relationships. Transcend that need for belonging. Find that in me first. Then all those other relationships will come into fulfillment. Okay, that our self, our self-esteem. Oh, for heaven's sakes. Here Christ says, you know, no, <laughs> deny yourself. Pick up your, your cross. Follow me. Why? Because we find our self-esteem. We find ourself in Christ. This is what St. Paul is telling us of the new man. We only become fully who we're supposed to be in Christ. And we should be you know, always, always extremely skeptical of just ourself and our own fallen nature. That's why St. Francis referred to himself. He referred to the, the flesh, the fallen aspect of himself as brother ass. He, he literally viewed it as a, almost a separate person that was as stubborn as a mule. So Jesus is telling us, no, 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 you, you don't do all those other things. Oh, and then I'm just this little bonus at the top, <laughs> the little cherry on top of the Sunday. No, he got it all wrong. Come to me first, come to me first, and then I am the pyramid. That's it. I'm the beginning, the end. I'm the alpha and the omega. It's everything is either in me. If you start stepping out of that, forget about it. It will all unravel. That's why it's not like we can just pick and choose. Okay, you know, yeah, I, I can kind of deny myself a little bit. But boy, renounce my possessions or you know, hate uh, my mother, my father, my spouse, my kids. How many people have seen this where people have all of their esteem wrapped up in their kids? You know, gosh, that, that's just not good for anybody. So, no, we have to accept all those because we need to bring Christ into all of our life. Otherwise, you know, it's, the chain is always as strong, only as strong as the weakest link. All right, so there we go. That is what Maslow can learn from Christ. Where do we start with this? Where do we start with this? Or where do we go with this? Is it coming in so that we can, when we hear this, we want to be reflecting uh, on this? And where in our life, where do we have aspects of our life that need that transcendence, that need to be brought over to Christ in the ways that he's asking? And, and when Monday comes, here's one suggestion. Fulton Sheen, who was quite a student of psychology himself, <laughs> Maslow could have learned a lot from Fulton Sheen. He just recommends we listen to the voice in our head. Where do we spend most of our time in our interior conversation? What does it focus on? What does it focus on? Because usually that little voice, when we just let it run, when we don't rein it in, generally that's kind of our fallen nature <laughs> going off just, just like mad, that little demon. Now, is, is it always kind of comparing ourselves to others? Gee, you know, why don't we get the attention they get? Or is it anxiety over our bank account or is it you fixated on food and our, our next meal wherever that little voice keeps going that's probably a pretty good place to start of uh, that part in our own little pyramid that, that's slipping slipping away that's not being brought under christ's dominion there not being brought into his transcendence so a suggestion for Monday as, as we come into the week of bringing this gospel message with us, where is that voice going? Final thought in the spirit of answering atheism. And obviously the, the gospel reading has 
<laughs> almost everything we need to know right, about psychology. But the first reading also, Wisdom, it, it's just fascinating. It, just that, and this is going back how many thousands of years, but how relevant it is today, especially for the Maslow's of the world, all of the new atheists that just refuse to see these aspects, the basic aspects of our fallen nature that get in our way, that trip up their plan for creating this utopian society. You, you just listen to this. Who can know God's counsel or who can conceive what the Lord intends? For the deliberations of mortals are timid and unsure are our plans. For the corruptible body burdens the soul and the earthen shelter weighs down the mind that has many concerns. And scarce do we guess the things on earth. And what is within our grasp we find with difficulty. But when things are in heaven, who can search them out? Or who ever knew your counsel, except you had given wisdom and sent your Holy Spirit from on high? And thus were the paths of those on earth made straight. Again, just how current and fresh and relevant those words are today. You know, how we just kind of fumble and bumble with things, and, you know, in our arrogance, because fine, we can make some electronic gadgets that we couldn't make back then. But sociologically, psychologically, interpersonally, are we advancing anywhere? Hardly. And our corruptible bodies that, that burden our souls, our corruptible bodies that include our material brains, how they burden our souls, they saw so much clearer the reality of the human person then than our atheist society sees it now. But there's one thing that's different. Remember, this is being written in Old Testament times when they did not generally have the Holy Spirit. There was very special occasions when the Holy Spirit came down, either broadly to society, like the Israelites wandering through the desert, being led by the pillar of fire, the Shekinah that was the Holy Spirit, or, or just a very few privileged individuals, particularly the prophets, would receive directly that guidance of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, everyone else was just kind of left to their own devices. And that was the whole problem. That's why Christ had to come and redeem us and heal us. Aha, so things are different now from then. Yeah, we're still our, our fallen human beings and left to our own devices. We're still that same fumbling, bumbling mess. But what Maslow doesn't understand and what all the atheist society doesn't understand, what Christ is trying to tell us in that gospel is that there is something different now. We have three things that they didn't have in Old Testament times. We have three things now that sadly our atheist society doesn't recognize that are, are the key to human happiness in this life and, and eternally, ultimately. First, we have the Holy Spirit now. We, as long as we remain in a state of grace to guide us and protect us, to counsel us, we have Christ in whom we find ourselves, and Christ, you know, the healer, Christ, the, the psychotherapist par excellence. And we have a direct connection now to our Heavenly Father. And that, by the way, is going to be the topic next week. So for now, wishing you a wonderful week ahead of you know, hopefully new inspiration on parts of ourselves that we can bring more and more into that transcendence of Christ, more of us in, into that beautiful pyramid of Christ's life with that fulfillment that he desires for each one of us. Blessings to you in your journey with Christ.